Hello, you're listening to the K-12 Tech Podcast, bringing you insights into the world of education technology. Stay tuned as we discuss the past, the present, and most importantly, the future of technology in our schools. Today is an exciting day. I'm here in beautiful Salt Lake City. Um, We'll take some B-roll of the mountains when we're driving around. I'm here joined by Christopher Larson, the technology director at Granite school district here in Salt Lake City, 60,000 plus devices. Thanks for being on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so this is our first time on the road. So if there's any tech, technological issues or anything like that, give us some grace here. Um, but uh, I had to shove everything into a big suitcase. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I loved your story. We did a quick 25, 30 minute you know, intro call a few months ago and it worked out. We were opening up our new Salt Lake City office and I was already going to be here. I'm like, you know what? This is one I would love to do a first part origins, your story starting from, you know, you'll get into it, but starting, you know, kind of at a teacher level, working your way all the way up of a massive district. And then um, the second part, we're going to talk about what you're really passionate about with personal development and what you guys have really done here, which really excited me a lot. So appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. No, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to kind of celebrate and share the great things my team and the teachers in our district are doing for kids and uh, it's exciting work. That's awesome. So let's start from the beginning. Um, When did you know you wanted to be in education? When did you figure out that was maybe a skill set of yours and kind of talk us through that journey, maybe high school through college? Yeah, um, probably not a traditional pathway. Um, I was a business marketing major. I had a course called Business Spanish. Uh, I speak Spanish. we were asked to volunteer to translate parent-teacher conferences at an elementary oh, wow. school. And I discovered that I really loved working with elementary age students and their families and uh, changed my major to elementary ed with uh, an ESL endorsement. And What's ESL? Uh, ESL is English as a Second Language. Yeah. Um, and never looked back. Uh, applied for jobs. Granite has a a very high uh, multilingual learner population. And so there were more jobs down here. I went to Utah State University. Uh, I started teaching in uh, fifth grade and loved what I was doing. The technology part kind of came came up. I I didn't know that I was that interested in that. My school got new tech, and I think because I was a young new teacher, they assumed that I was the guy to try it out. Uh, I had classroom iPods. I tried those. I had some classroom cameras and I started to really get excited about the connections my students were able to make with the content when I was using tech in engaging ways. And when you talk about um, student iPods, like what, yeah. what, was that mostly towards like the, was that just like in a normal classroom setting? Was that ESL? Um, uh, was it was in a normal towards? classroom setting. This was uh, probably the 2011 school year. Okay. Um, back when I was starting and, um, yeah, I was given a cart. No one really quite knew how to teach with them or how to use them. There wasn't a lot of guidance at the time, not because we, I don't mean that as a criticism, just that yeah. it was new and everybody was learning the potential of, of technology in the classroom at that time. When did you, when, when did you graduate, become a teacher? Like what was your first year? My first year was uh, 2010, 2011 okay. in the classroom. Yeah. So that was like, so you only did a few years teaching and then you accelerated pretty quickly into technology. Right. I, I immediately found that I wanted to make, um, a, don't get me wrong. Teachers make a huge individual impact on students. I found that I really liked, I, I was able to help my principal with our school improvement plan. And I found that I was really passionate about making those kind of system level goals and, uh, building up a, a culture at our school of how do we tackle getting better at what we do, reaching more students. And that led me to being interested in going into admin. And so I did go into admin very early in my career. Yeah. And like when I think about someone who's like a teacher, they've got a lot on their plate to begin with teaching. And right. then I'm assuming that stuff is just done on top of your normal workload. Was that um, a principal or an administrator who was kind of breathing that like, Hey, you got some talent in this area. You want to work on a task force. How did that look? Yeah. I've been very lucky in my career to, to have really strong mentors. And so I think my principal saw something in me and asked me if I wanted to be one of the leaders in developing our, our school improvement plan. And, uh, she was right. I was very interested and I 
grew pretty passionate about that kind of work. What does that like work look like for the, the, the improvement plan? Like, what does that cover? Does that cover like a little bit of technology, a little bit of transportation, logistics? Like, I, I just, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I, um, you know, I'm not traditional. In education, I find that the improvement efforts are ever changing. And uh, back then, um, it involved us finding a need as a school and then setting goals and creating a plan for what, what we needed. So the plan we looked at was related to professional learning, having each of us shadow each other and learn better teaching techniques. And our goal was to improve our reading scores at the time at that school. Um, our, our improvement structure is similar still in Granite where uh, principals have the autonomy to identify the need based on assessment scores and data and yeah. then create a plan that they think will have the most impact on whatever they've targeted. Yeah, I love that. So that's 2010, 2011 time. You're starting to work on that. What, what are your next steps? Because obviously, I don't know if you did have a bachelor's degree in early education and then yes. that, I'm sure that took additional education that you had to go. Yeah, so I went back to school at Utah State University through a distance program. So I was able to keep working full time and then I was taking credits on the side. I I had an opportunity in Granite to be an intern assistant principal at one of our junior highs. So that meant I took a year off of teaching mm. and I went and I was an assistant principal to junior high for a year. Um, and then after that, I was seeking out administrative jobs. I wasn't hired my first year, but I really feel that that led me here. Cause in that interim year, I worked at our district STEM school. Yeah. Uh, we have a kind of a district charter um, where half of the students are special permit so they open enroll to to attend our stem school and i taught sixth grade there and it was probably my favorite year of really of teaching i had a really awesome grade level team we were able to do a lot of innovative things and really dive into my passion for tech in the classroom so so what was happening at that time at that sixth grade stem like what stuff did you have maybe the freedom to do that you didn't previously yeah, we had one-to-one -one iPads at the classroom in the yeah. classroom. So it had been, you know, I think people realized that iPods weren't really a feasible yeah. learning device. Um, iPads allowed for uh, more uh, more potential as, as a device. So we had those. Um, it facilitated all kinds of things, even just taking video of the engineering projects we were doing, uh, presenting using pictures of different stages of experiments allowing students opportunity to interact with real world phenomena because they had access to the internet on their device. Um, so it really opened up. That was prior to our district having Chromebooks. Uh, this would have been, I want to say the 2013, 14 school year. Yeah. Um, and Chromebooks were kind of a brand new thing back then. Yeah. And we, we had started to experiment with them as a district, but they hadn't been implemented in the classroom. Yeah. Yet. That was like yeah. Dell Chromebook one. Yeah. The, 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 the Samsung silver yep. Chromebooks that everyone exactly. had and the hinge so, covers just deteriorated yeah. on those. So at the time, um, to give you some context, uh, yeah, our tech director at the time, Patrick Flanagan, um, who I've kind of stood on the shoulders of, he, he started exploring, uh, Chromebooks and looking into would they work? Are they a good device? Um, we opened up things like Google Classroom. Yep. I think by happenstance, I happened to be the first teacher to use Google Classroom in our district because yep. I my principal was friends with Patrick and we ran into him and he was like, hey, we want to try Google Classroom. We're going to turn it on. Do you want me to turn it on for your classroom? And I tried it the next day with my sixth graders and fell in love with the ability to easily share things out and collaborate and even... I still remember facilitating my class when I had a sub. I just put everything in Google Classroom and... That was probably the sub's easiest job that they had had because I, I was still kind of responding to my students. Yeah. Right, I shouldn't have been doing that, but um, I was able to design things and and help them have more uh, kind of anytime, anywhere access to their learning. I feel like Google Classroom was one of the first like, rem this remote support is mm -hmm. a is a capability now. Yeah, I think before that, you know, cloud based was still pretty not new, but pretty new when it comes to like a government and in the classroom, but I, it's almost everybody on the podcast. They talk about like Google classroom and then the Google app suite and just how that, mm -hmm. like, Oh, it was the first time it really opened people's eyes up. To like things are changing. Right. You know, it's not just, I'm going to get on a word document and I forget to save and I 
do another three hours of work. Yeah, I remember at the end of the school year being excited, like, oh, it'd be really cool to have Chromebooks instead of iPads because um, yeah. they were a brand new thing. And I just thought I still was kind of taking my class down to the typing lab when we were doing yeah. writing assignments because the iPads were a challenge with that. But uh, that was when I, I got an assistant principal job the next school year. So I left the classroom and uh, from there I I came into this position and uh, really uh, probably get tired of my exposure to Chromebooks at this point. But um, yeah, no, great. I joke, they're a great classroom tool, but we've, uh, we have a lot of them now and we, you know, eat, sleep and breathe Chromebooks now. Yeah. So, I mean, probably at your district, if you have 60,000 students, you have what, probably 80,000 Chromebooks yeah, probably. that's about right. And then um, with your teachers, are you guys doing Chromebooks for teachers or do they have like a more premium device or? Uh, teachers have laptops. We've gradually been rolling that out. Yeah. Um, all of our schools, with the exception of a couple that are in unique circumstances, have teacher laptops right now. Yeah. Um, we tried we do teacher Chromebooks in some circumstances, but teachers typically need a more powerful device yeah. for some of the programs they need. So yeah. our teachers have laptops. We've, we implemented those as a way to help teachers be more mobile in the yeah. classroom and move around. So the devices we provide them are a, a 360 device that they can fold yeah. and ink with and project with while they're teaching. And it really is a configuration. Every school has got different needs. Uh, we know some schools, they do MacBooks for teachers because they're more intuitive, you know, and it all kind of depends on your base knowledge too. But, um, you know, I love that. And, you know, obviously in technology, getting through COVID and that just being a really, really stressful time. I know we were talking earlier how you were just saying, like, I worked basically sun up to sundown every single day to get through that period one thing I like to ask on like origins, like mental health is a big deal. It really is, especially in technology. Have you ever seen the, do you watch Seinfeld? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like when they ask the mailman, um, Oh, like why do all like people who work for the, uh, the postal service go crazy? Like, cause the mail never stops. <laughs> and I feel like that's what it's like for technology directors. It's yeah. like technology never stops. I've never really considered myself like Newman, but I guess maybe I am. <laughs> I'm not um, saying you're Newman. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I mean, I guess I can relate to that. Um, I think with anything that for me, I'm passionate about what I'm doing. I really enjoy yeah. the work. I enjoy working in schools and trying to do things to better the outcome and impact we have for students. So it can be hard to turn that off. Like, like you said, the mail never stops or the, yeah. you know, when you're passionate, I think about your work, it can be hard to, to balance that. So yeah, it's definitely a, uh, students need access to their work after school. You know, teachers need access to be grading things after school. So it it has to be a conscious choice to turn it off. Um, yeah. To balance that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, do you have any like personal disciplines or some things that you do more like a morning routine or something that you do to kind of keep yourself in shape, keep your mind in shape that way? Mm -hmm. You know, you're on top of your game. Um, I have three kids at home, so I have. I have twins that are second graders and I have a sixth grader. So I get home and um, the the home chaos starts, you know, as soon as I walk in the door. Um, I love my kids. Obviously, they're excited to see me. Um, they have their own homework. So we get dinner out of the way. We do their homework. Um, I hobby wise, I really and I find like music is helpful. I listen to a lot of music. Um, I that's another one of my passions, but I, I don't get a lot of maybe hobby time or time to myself, yeah. but, but I enjoy my family at this point in life and maybe the free yeah. time will come at some point. Yeah. That's, yeah. Sure. I, I've got, <laughs> do four, we all say that until we die? Yeah. I've got, <laughs> I've got four kids, so I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I work and then I go home and work and, but the work at home is a little cuter. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I see maybe the more direct, uh, rewards at home, like yeah. working directly with my Are own your kids. kids in granite schools. They're not. We live in Jordan School District, okay. which is a neighboring district. Yeah. Might be good to have some separation too sometimes. Like, <laughs> right, I don't have to deal with the bureaucracy. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I'm able to try things out with my kids. Like, oh, well, this latest tech tool, Yeah, how does it go over with second graders? How does it go over with sixth graders? Uh, my kids probably have a love-hate relationship with being the guinea pigs in some of those yeah. uh, experiments, but it's fun. Yeah. 
I'm like one of those parents who only the, the newest gaming system we have at home is an N64. So we as a family <laughs> get together and play like Super Smash Brothers and stuff. I'm I'm the nerdy parent who's still playing, you know, Minecraft with my kid or yeah. uh, Animal Crossing or so I guess I, I do play a lot of video games. Uh, I think that's maybe the the intersection of work and and play for me, but that's amazing. Um, so for you, how, how long total have you been in the position you're in now currently? This is my seventh school year in this position. Okay, so a while. I mean, yeah. for technology director-wise, that's, that's a while. That's a long time. Yeah, um, it it feels it feels like it is compared to maybe people that have been before, but I'm still excited by what I do. I think tech, one of the things I love about my job is it's never the same. Uh, we problem solve all the time, and I love problem solving, but every day of the seven years, there's been a problem that I hadn't heard of, you know, yeah. something new. Never had. Somehow the problems keep evolving and reproducing. And um, so it's never boring and there's always a challenge. And I also found that like naively, I think that I thought making system-wide change was going to be something that could be done quickly. And what I found is it's very slow and incremental yeah. and I feel that I'm finally starting to see some of the the work that my team has been putting in. We're starting to see the fruits of that out in schools, and that's exciting. Yeah, I love that. So to close out every section, I always like to ask during the origin section is what are three pieces of advice you can give someone who wants to eventually be in a technology director role in, or a, you know, I'm a, I'm a learning infrastructure role? What are three pieces of advice you could give them on their journey to get there? I think try to have as many diverse experiences as you can. I think that, like I mentioned with the STEM school, I wouldn't have been prepared for this role if I hadn't uh, <clears throat> had that experience teaching at a STEM school or had an experience teaching at, I've taught at both um, kind of schools that are um, in less impacted parts of our district and in more yeah. highly impacted parts of our district. I worked in customer service uh, in a call center for four years in college. And I think that I built skills that I still use every day yeah. uh, for uh, communicating things out and, and dealing with challenging problems and helping people move forward, helping people build skills. So I think don't pigeonhole yourself into like a very specialized idea. Yeah. I think look at maybe what you're, what skills you need to develop and find experiences to help you get there. So when I wasn't hired the first time as an administrator, I, that's when I made the shift to the STEM school of, you know, I need to build more experience. I'm new in this career. Uh, I need to have a broader exposure to more things in order to be effective as an, as an admin. And I, I think that that's been something that I've benefited from is just trying to have a broad diversity of experience. Yeah. I love that. I mean, you're not the only one I've like interviewed over the last year that's had that same thing of like, did all this work, went to school, got all this education and then applied, didn't get it. But almost every single time the people who have worked their way up to these bigger positions have been like, okay, what's next? Not just like, oh, poor is me. Woe is me. It's yeah. how do I continue on and push? And sometimes it might not seem that straightforward, but those experiences still give you an edge in wherever you end up, you yeah. know, maybe because I had some business background that helps me with managing a large budget, you yeah. know, managing staffing, things like that, that, uh, if I would have been set on being a teacher from day one, maybe I don't have those same experiences. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, Chris, thank you so much for being on for the origin section. Yeah. We're going to move on to personal development. <laughs>